it's it's uh, it's puzzling to everybody. It's problematic for everybody, and I think it behooves us as um, as advocates to always remember that that we're dealing with human beings. We're really trying, very often, trying their best to decide a case um, in the way that's humane and that comes out comes at the truth. Uh, within the LGBT community, it also behooves us, and this is this is this is uh, Neil, the lecturer here, um, to be on the side of adjudicators finding out. Who is telling the truth and who is not? Because there's a real there's a real um, price at stake here. And that is, if adjudicators fall under the presumption that people can fake their sexual orientation or gender identity, there's no way to tell, um, and that increasingly people will apply for refugee status based on being LGBT with impunity. That they won't the cases won't be denied. Then the bona fide cases won't be granted either. Um, and from this comes our motivation to work with adjudicators to train and to help them as, be as best as possible to, to uh, find the true cases, find the true cases of people are Yes? I'm just wondering, um, so is it, is it necessary to show that you are in fact LGBTI or just that the persecution is based on a belief that you are? So that, you know, if you have the evidence that this is why you're being persecuted, but you have a client who hasn't really grappled to it to be able to use a language that we would need to use in American context, you know, um, you would still have a claim, right? Or in, um, in so you're raising a really, really fascinating issue, um, and um, and I think I'm not the best person to speak to it, um, but. Uh, imputed sexual orientation or gender identity definitely is a ground for relief. So if people are persecuting you because they think you are, you may well be eligible for relief, for Refugee uh, Act relief. But in fact, the vast majority of, uh, of people who are, but haven't come to terms with who they are, won't come out uh, and they won't be able to present their claims. Um, and it's af actually, I've uh, spoken to, to adjudicators at UNHCR. Um, there's one I remember in particular who told me, Neil, I've got this, I've got this applicant who is just gay as a goose. <laughs> but, he claims, but he claims that he's running away from, um, from political persecution. And I know that's not true. The claim is not consistent. It, it doesn't hold together. Um, I'd like to be able to give him relief, but I can't because he's not coming out and claiming. Uh, that he's gay, uh, and under that circumstance, I mean, there, you know, I, of course, I'd like to. I wanted to argue that yes, you should find a way and you know, do everything possible to help him come out. But you know, she had three interviews that same morning besides him, and two interviews in the afternoon after him, and didn't have time to play his psychotherapist to help him come out. Uh, so she ended up denying the case, um, and that's that is what happens most of the time because the vast majority of LGBTs don't come out at the interview. And if we have a minute, we'll go into that. Uh, key problems of uh, credibility uh, are lack of knowledge about sexual orientation and gender identity. So a lot of uh, so adjudicators very often, much less here in the United States. The asylum office is really good um, in, in adjudicating these claims. The U.S. asylum office and the Canadian asylum office, by the way. Um, adjudicators don't know how to identify who isn't isn't LGBT. Um, in Turkey, we've had in the past. Uh, many cases denied because the applicant wasn't wearing makeup, wasn't wearing, if a gay applicant wasn't wearing women's clothing, couldn't possibly be gay. It's because the adjudicators have entertained stereotypes about what LGBT is, and training is absent in those contexts. So they just don't know. Um, again, it's very easy to attribute pernicious motivations there. The fact is that what's really going on is that there are cultural prejudices that are coupled with lack of training. Uh, they're leading people to apply their, their everyday values to the refugees that they see. Uh, and if someone uh, is used to living in a country where being out is completely impossible, because the, the price is very high of being out, and the vast majority of, let's say, gay people are in the closet, and the only people that they see who are gay uh, wear makeup, then they assume that in order to be gay you have to be wearing makeup. And you've got to train them otherwise, otherwise they're not going to know. Um, lack of knowledge about LGBT specific conditions in countries of origin is another um, reason where mostly outside of the US claims get denied. Um, we've seen claims denied because uh, the applicant didn't know who Oscar Wilde was. The Afghani applicant doesn't know who Oscar Wilde was. Um, and every homosexual knows who Oscar Wilde is. 
Um, Self-denial, as I said, is the most, most common, common enemy of the LGBT applicant, and I believe that still goes on here, even here in the U.S. The vast majority of people will not come to a perfect stranger and admit to them that they are LGBT. Um, the vast majority of applicants are grappling and struggling every day to come out with their own sexuality, vis-a-vis -vis their own families, vis-a-vis -vis themselves, and the belief of, of their own values as a human being. They're certainly not going to go to a government official, um, whom they perceive very often as threatening, and tell them this terrible thing about themselves. So uh, the vast majority don't come out. Uh, another issue that we found that's um, that's extremely challenging is dissociation. Very common in uh, many of our clients who, especially the ones who have suffered sexual abuse as children, and that's very common in LGBT cases in some areas of the world, uh, where the applicant enters the room um, and becomes threatened. Um, in a threatening environment, someone who's been subject to childhood sexual abuse usually checks out uh, and is not able to hear the questions and is not able to answer the questions directly. And we've seen many cases uh, denied um, several times, and had to be appealed several times on, to, until we finally were able to get through them, because the applicants themselves were inconsistent. Uh, and we ourselves would have denied the case in the, in the same sort of in situation. <coughs> keep moving. Oh, there's one issue here that, uh, that we touched on before that I think is very important, and the issue is self-defining. In the United States, we know gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. There are flags in the street. You can tell who you are right away by looking by looking up on Market Street. <clears throat> and you can self-define with relative impunity in certain places in the United States. But in most of the countries in the world, that is not the case. Um, and there's a certain, uh, I would say, arrogance on the part of us Westerners to assume that everyone else in the world can do that uh, if only they had the right knowledge. Uh, that everyone would be happy to self to self identify as LGBT, LGB or T, uh, just if they could. That's not the case at all. Uh, in many countries in the world, people have looked for millennia not self identifying as LGBT, and they're going to continue to not self identify. Um, and um, the problem is that that the Refugee Act and the Convention require you to self identify in order to get relief. So how do you bridge that? <laughs> I was going to talk about country of origin information, but I think I'm out of time, and I think Roy is going to talk all about it. Uh, so I'll just leave you with a few uh, with a few final thoughts uh, about uh, what's happening to LGBT refugees uh, today. Uh, we're finding that the few of our clients who have actually managed to come to the United States are resettling in poverty. Uh, we're finding that a lot of the ones who come in and requested um, asylum are also living in poverty, living in isolation, living out of contact with their with the community, um, out of contact with their community of origin, with their religious community, um, and also, sadly, not supported by the LGBT community very often. Uh, and one of the easiest things to fix is actually, uh, we believe, to get the community here to understand the issues to support the ones who are able to escape the persecution and to end up here in the United States, uh, and especially here in San Francisco. Uh, so, um, well, there's a lot you can do on that front if you're here in this room. Um, you can support refugees who've come in. Uh, you can give LGBT refugees housing. Uh, we have a client who's arriving 17 days and doesn't have a place to live. Um, you can uh, support the refugees by uh, giving them a job or by talking to your friends who have jobs, who might have a job available. Any low-paid job is good. Um, and most of all, by giving people a sense of, the refugees a sense of community and a sense of support and a sense that there's a reason to keep living after what they've gone through.